Hi, I'm Dr. Johnson Haas, and welcome to Earth Parts. In this section, I want to talk about basics. What science is? What is science about as a discipline? What is the scientific way of thinking, the approach to problems? And to get there, we need to talk about what science is versus what is pseudoscience, and how you can tell the difference, what things you should look for, and ways you should avoid thinking, logical fallacies where your argument is broken for a specific reason. It's important to be able to evaluate all those things, to be not just a scientist, but um, a rational, critical thinker about anything. So we'll proceed with first trying to talk about what science is. And I don't mean the profession necessarily, I mean the overall approach. The overall approach of science is to deal with things that can be tested by observation or which can be disproved by hard evidence. Basically testing for everything that is real, that is accessible to a method of testing and measurement that will give us a firm answer and it can be reproduced. Science is not lab coats. In contrast, what we define as a pseudoscience is a subject that uses science -y sounding words to appear reasonable, to, to seem impressive with complicated language, uh, but are actually just fronts because they don't, they don't make testable claims that bear up under scrutiny. Actually, a lot of untestable stuff, superstitions, or outright scams come at you in the form of pseudoscience. Something like homeopathy, for example, is a pseudoscience because it's not based on evidence, it's based upon a belief system. I want to start, though, with talking about science and what science is based on. Science is, of course, itself as an endeavor, uh, a thing that is based upon bedrock assumptions, which themselves can be tested. That's the whole point. Science is, an, is trying to make yourself less wrong by checking your work against somebody else's and doing that a lot until everybody's sure that everybody's got the same answer on the homework. And then, okay, I can trust that answer now. So science is based upon a few assumptions, but the assumptions themselves are testable. They have to be, or else they can't be a part of this. To begin with, let's start pretty basically. Science tends to assume that events, po events follow patterns or result from causes that can be understood that we don't live, apparently, we don't live in a magical universe where I can cast a spell and summon a, a panda bear or something. I can't do that because events follow patterns and we can understand the rules by which the events and the patterns operate. This might not have been true. We might have found ourselves, I suppose, in a universe where magic works for some reason in some way. And we should be able to test that too, shouldn't we? If it's part of the world, if it's part of how things operate, it wouldn't remain in some mysterious closet with wizard hats. It would be a part of the textbook of how things work. So that seems to be a, a pretty, a pretty uh, reliable assumption. At least so far, this seems to be how the universe works. Second, the rules of nature are the same throughout the universe, and they always have been at least as long as the universe in its present instance condition has existed since the Big Bang, the rules of nature should be consistent throughout space and time. If they're not, we would see that. We would look back at starlight approaching us in the sky, ancient starlight from long ago galaxies, and we would see something's wrong with it. It's off somehow. It's not working. We don't see that. We see things that make sense, that follow the rules that we have today, the laws of physics. As far as we know, the rules of nature are the same throughout the universe and always have been. Third, scientific reasoning tends to be inductive. This is not so hard and fast a rule. It tends to be more of the tendency of how the overall process is, is uh, carried out. So what's inductive reasoning? You've probably heard of deductive reasoning. That's often associated in popular culture with Sherlock Holmes and solving mysteries. 
Uh, and that's fine. And deductive reasoning is a useful tool. But science is more about not trying to determine a specific about whether the butcher killed his wife or something like that. It's, it's more about trying to make observations that get to the point of a key question and then trying to make enough observations that make sense, check your work, and then you can apply that set of observations to make a broad generalization. The, the classical example is Galileo dropping objects off of a tower observed how fast they'd fall. And if he dropped equal sized spheres, it doesn't matter if they're made of iron or wood, they would fall basically at the same rate. Air resistance does matter. But the idea is if you measure that again and again and again, you would be able to eventually calculate what, how fast you fall, the acceleration due to gravity. And that's inductive. That means you've made 50, 100 measurements, maybe 1,000. Maybe it's a bigger project than that. But the point is you then say, aha, I have seen this happen over and over again. I have accounted for different variables. I've done all the work. And I'm going to make a generalization. That's inductive reasoning. It's not deductive. Deductive is Sherlock Holmes saying, the butcher never arrives home until 8 p.m. And his wife was murdered at 6 p.m. Therefore, he couldn't have done it. Those kind of absolute statements in human behavior obviously are not, I would think, all that reliable. You can make basic statements like that and use deductive reasoning in science, but a lot of science is based upon experiment, observation, over and over again, until you build up enough information that you can then generalize it safely. Fourth, generalizations can be tested and they can be disproved if untrue. No test is possible. The generalization is unscientific and frankly quite useless. So the generalizations we pull out of inductive reasoning based on experiments and observation, those can be themselves tested. We That's sort of the point of a lot of experiments, or should be, is to say, I'm proposing a certain thing, like how a particular thing works, physics or some kind of biochemical thing. It doesn't really matter. I'm proposing, I'm making a claim. My job as a scientist or as a rational person should be to take that claim and try to rip it apart, find its weaknesses, test it. If it can be tested, we'll find out how to disprove it. If we go to an experiment and it's disproven, it's disproven. And this leads us to the fifth point I want to make, at least right now, is that new evidence can disprove ideas if they are wrong, as I just said. But here's the, here's the thing a lot of people get snagged on. Absolute proof is impossible. However, and that's where people get snagged. They stop there. But there's more to it. However, we can still understand things to a very, very high degree of confidence. Absolute proof outside of a mathematical proof is not something scientists do. Scientists are about assessing whether something is a plausible idea, testing it, and trying to rip it apart. And if it stays up, no matter what you do to it, well, maybe you might be onto something. But it's not about absolute proof. It's about assessing odds and seeing, is this a good argument? Uh, does it seem plausible? Is this supported by facts uh, that have nothing to do with how I feel about it? New evidence disproves things if they're wrong. And the point of science and experimentation is to find out if they're wrong. A lot of people get hung up on the concept of error and uncertainty and don't realize that every scientific measurement, every observation is always uncertain. Your eyes don't have an infinite pixel resolution. However, you that implies there's a lot of light coming at your eyes, a lot of detail you simply don't register. We can't build a machine that doesn't have error. Everything we build, Galileo's first telescopes were paltry by modern standards, and ours are paltry by the standards of telescopes 50 years from now. Every measurement, however, that every telescope, every caliper, every yardstick, every sound check ever makes is going to have error and uncertainty associated with it. The idea, though, is that in science, by looking seriously at the results of observations, you can determine basically your degree of error. How uncertain are your numbers? And then you can assess in a grown-up way that you might know, for example, based on everything we have in every branch of science that contributes to this, that the age of our planet and our solar system is about 4.6 billion years. Now, that's a number that's rounded off because we can tell within a certain range of accuracy, but beyond that resolution point, that fine scale beyond where we can look, 
we have to say, okay, we don't know absolutely, but we know to about maybe one or two percent error. So for example, we know the age of the Earth to about 4.6 billion years, plus or minus, and these are real numbers, plus or minus 0.1 billion years, roughly. So plus or minus 100 million years, which is a long time, but not compared to the time scale of Earth's history. That amounts to about a 2% error. And so that's how we measure things. We always have an uncertainty associated with every measurement, but by being careful and thorough, we can take that uncertainty and we can drive it down to the smallest possible value. And then we have operating space. We have confidence. Now I'll tell you how confident we can be. About 10 years ago, as of this recording, NASA launched the New Horizons probe, a little rocket machine that flew across the solar system and then rendezvoused with the dwarf planet Pluto at the outer edge of our solar system a decade later. And it made its rendezvous within, I think, about a second of the expected program time. This was done correctly because we know gravity that well. We know the numbers that well. The age of the Earth is not 4.6 billion years plus or minus 19 billion years. It doesn't work that way. The age of the Earth is something we know very well, and we have our uncertainties down. And so every measurement has error, every measurement has uncertainty, but within limits that we can assess. Prove it. Provide proof. Science is often not about proving something as much as it is about assessing based on what we know, prior plausibility, supporting evidence, experimental evidence if there is any, strong historical evidence if we have that, and then being rational and careful and reasonable. So for example, science is about assessing a good bet from a bad one, so science cannot, for example, disprove the existence of Thor, the thunder god from Norse mythology, that the mighty Thor is actually a real being. Science can't really disprove that some high-tech alien civilization likes to look like Norse people and show up here sometimes. But it can assess, based on everything we know, the likelihood that that's real. We can look at the historical record of archaeology and linguistics and written literature and cultural tradition, and we can assess all of this and say, where is the real evidence that this stuff actually happened? Where are the archaeological sites? Where are the mysterious alien artifacts? There's no evidence that any of that ever happened. So science cannot disprove that, but science can tell you, you know, that's a really bad bet. I wouldn't put a lot of money on a bet that that's true, that it's real. And so science is not really about proof. It's more often about being in the business of assessing the likelihood and the chances. What's the, pro what's the plausibility? How well do we know that? Is it rational or irrational? How would we test it? What's the next step? What's step two? Where do we go? That's what science is about. To use the old Bertrand Russell example, science cannot disprove that there is a China teacup out there in space floating in orbit around the sun, intermediate distance from between Earth and Mars. I can't tell you that's not there. I can't assess that, the, that I'm gonna tell you absolutely no, that's impossible. I don't know, maybe there's some secret Soviet mission out there and for some reason there was a teacup and it got blown out of the hatch for some reason. I don't know. But based upon everything we know about the history of Soviet space program, technology, launches, all the rest of it, there doesn't seem to be any way that that can happen. So I'm trying to take seriously the idea of when there's a claim, can you test it? Can you disprove it? If there's no way to disprove it, there's no effective way to find out if there is a teacup out there or not. It doesn't affect anything else. And until you can find a way to test for that, it's not a question science can address or really cares about.